was so blessed uh, reading the devotional in the, in the Daily Bread, and we have those devotionals out at the Welcome Center. If you've never picked one of those up, just a great daily devotional. And they were talking the story of Louis Zamperini. And Louis Zamperini's military plane crashed in the ocean in the South Pacific uh, during the war, killing eight of the 11 men aboard. And Louis and a couple of his, his uh, cabin mates clambered onto life, rates, life rafts and for two months fended off sharks and uh, dodged stray bullets from the enemy, uh, ate some raw fish and birds, and they finally drifted on to an island where they were captured immediately. And for two years, uh, Louis was beaten tortured, worked mercilessly, mercilessly as a prisoner of war. And his, his story is told in the remarkable book, Unbroken, and a couple movies around that story as well. Louis endured slavery and was given the gift of a much-needed exit strategy and came home. But perhaps his greatest exit, his most profound exodus, came... Uh, the exodus from the spiritual and emotional pain he suffered through PTSD and the the nightmares, the alcohol addiction, um, just the demons of war that lingered on long after he came home. But he finally gave his life to Jesus at a Billy Graham revival in Los Angeles and, and made Jesus his Lord and Savior and found the true exit strategy that he needed. I've loved the series so far, and in our first week, Pastor Bill talked about how King Pharaoh of Egypt in many ways represents, embodies our, our, our number one enemy, Satan himself. And he doesn't care about our identity in Christ. He wants to keep us in bondage, even uh, destroy our lives through the, through the bondage, through the prisons we can find ourselves in. And last week, Pastor Justin talked about how Moses is the Savior example, representation to be, to forewarn of Jesus coming to set his people free, to let his people go. This week we pick up the story uh, in in the story of Exodus chapter 6 through 13, where uh, God sends the 10 plagues on Egypt through his servant Moses, and then gives the people the Passover to celebrate and always remember how he will let his people go out from Egypt to set them free, for which they were in bondage and slavery for 430 years. So today our big idea is this. Through the plagues and the Passover, God demonstrates his sovereignty as the one true God we must worship and obey. First of all, God's sovereignty in the plagues. The Israelites had been enslaved in Egypt for 430 years. And while they still uh, believed in God or worshiped God, not a lot of them really thought he was going to, at this time, after so long, take them out of bondage, really free them. It begs the question to us, what are we doubting about God because he has yet to answer us? Chances are we haven't been waiting 430 years for an answer. Follow along as I read the beginning of our story in, for this text in Exodus 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. The Egyptians, like many pagan cultures, worshipped a variety of nature gods and attributed uh, their powers to the natural phenomenon they would see in the world around them. There was a God of the sun, of the river, the crop, the crops, childbirth. And so events like annual flooding of the Nile, they would see as the evidence of their God's power and, and goodwill. When Moses approached Pharaoh, demanding he let the people go, Pharaoh responded, Who is the Lord that I should obey? 
his voice to let Israel go. I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And so thus begins the challenge to see whose God is more powerful. The first plague, turning the Nile to blood, was the judgment against the god Apis, the god of the Nile, Isis, the goddess of the Nile, and Canum, the guardian of the Nile. The Nile was also believed to be the bloodstream of the god Osiris, who was reborn each year when the river was flooded. The river formed the basis of daily life. It was the economy of Egypt. And so in this, in this plague, it was devastated because millions of fish died and the river was unusable. Pharaoh was told, by this you will know that I am the Lord. The second plague brings frogs from the Nile. And this is a judgment against the god Heket, the frog-headed goddess of birth. Frogs were thought to be sacred and not killed. Don't go stomping on those frogs now. God had the frogs invade every home of the Egyptians. They were filled with them. And when they died, there would be these piles of the frogs, which is an offense to their god of the frogs. The third plague was the gnats, and this was a judgment of Set, the god of the desert. Up to this point, in the first two plagues, the Pharaoh's magicians were able to copy Moses uh, and the plagues that had happened, the, the blood, the Nile turning to blood and the frogs coming. But this one they were not able to copy. And they told Pharaoh, this is the finger of God, a symbol of divine power. The fourth plague, the flies, was a judge, judgment against, um, well, we're just going to call him the fly god because I don't want to think that you heard your pastor cuss in church because it's similar to a cuss word. So just the fly god, okay? And God, again, distinguishes between the Israelites and the Egyptians. The flies, swarm of flies, did not bother the Israelites. The fifth plague, the death of, of livestock, was a judgment of the goddess Hathor, and the god of Apis, who were both depicted as cattle. As with the previous plague, God again distinguishes and does not come against the livestock of his Israelites. And Pharaoh sent spies out, investigators, to see if, if this was affected in the Israelites, and it wasn't. But instead, he hardened his heart even more and wouldn't let God's people go. The sixth plague boils was a judgment against several gods over health and disease. And again, we see the progression of God's sovereignty because not only could the magicians not perform these plagues, they couldn't stand in the presence of Moses because of the boils all over their body and on their feet. God is sovereign. They were powerless against the God of Israel. And before God sends the last three plagues, Pharaoh is warned and given a special message from God that these plagues would be more severe than the others. And so we read in Exodus 9, Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh, and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says, Let my people go, so that they may worship me, or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you, and your officials, and your people, so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. And so one by one, God is casting down the powerless idols of the Egyptians. And we hear this most famous line from the narrative, let my people go. I love an African-American gospel culture how they so identify with the narrative of, of the Israelites and the Egyptian story of Exodus, right? And when you're a people enslaved for many years in our country, you identify with this. I love the old, the spiritual, go down, Moses, way down, Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh, say it with me. Let my people go. Not auditioning for the Christmas musical or... But what, what's interesting, what caught my 
that, that phrase, let my people go, we stop there. But we can't stop there if we want true freedom, if we want an exit strategy in Jesus. Because what does God say? Let my people go so that they may worship me. To have freedom, we need to go out from bondage. We need to go out from false idols. We need to leave them. But then we need to turn our hearts totally to God and worship him. That's part two. <laughs> Let my people go so that they may worship me. I love the phrase, uh, idols, which are false gods. Idols always overpromise and underdeliver. Only God is sovereign. Only God is the God of the universe and the God of our hearts and the one that can free us. As an example of his grace, God warned Pharaoh, hey kids, we got to be quiet to be in church, okay? Thank you. As an example of his grace, God warned Pharaoh to gather whatever cattle and crops remained from the previous plagues and to shelter them. He said, bring the cattle in. And some Egyptians heeded this warning and some didn't. And so the seventh plague, hail, attacked the sky goddess and the crop fertility god and the storm god. And this hail was like no other hail seen before. Again, the children of God were miraculously protected. No hail damaged any of their lands. And before God brought the next plague, he told Moses that the Israelites would be able to tell their children, generation after generation, what God did to set them free and to bring them out. And the eighth plague, locusts came against the gods of of Nut and Osiris and Set. And whatever had been destroyed before and left, the hail completely wiped out. The ninth plague, darkness, was aimed at the sun god Ray, and Pharaoh himself was an embodiment of this god to be the light. Well, darkness comes for three days, except in the homes of the Israelites, they had light. The tenth and last plague, the death of the firstborn males, was a judgment on Isis, the protector of children. And in this play, God was teaching the Israelites a deep spiritual lesson that pointed to Christ. And like the other plagues, the Israelites were saved in their association from God. But in this one, they had to respond in an act of faith. And so demonstrating the power and control, we see God's sovereignty in the plagues. But secondly, as the tenth and final plague is explained, we see God's sovereignty In the Passover, God commanded each family to take an unblemished male lamb to kill it. And the blood of the lamb was to be smeared on the top of their door and on the sides of the doorways. The lamb was to be roasted and eaten that night. And any family that did not follow God's instructions would succumb to this plague, the death of the firstborn male. God would send the destroyer through the land of Egypt with orders to kill the firstborn in every household, but to pass over the house of the Israelites where the blood of the lamb was over the door. And they would take hyssop plant and spread the blood over the door and on the sides. That's why we get the name Passover. When the destroyer saw the blood, he passed over that home and did not enter that home. 1 Corinthians 5.17 teaches that Jesus became our Passover when he died to deliver us from the bondage of sin. And while the Israelites found God's protections in every home, the Egyptians were wiped out. The firstborn died in every home. And finally, the cry of the land, finally Pharaoh said, out you go. As Jesus was about to die on the cross, we read in John 19, later knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it. 
put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is not just any thirst that Jesus has on the cross. It's a complete thirst, a reaching to the end of his physical strength. And while he is coming to the lowest point of his human life, he is at that same moment being lifted up. The soldier showed some sort of compassion and used the stalk of a hyssop plant to lift some wine vinegar to him. Did you catch that? the hyssop plant that was used in the Passover. And so in this one little detail in the crucifixion story, we see Jesus becomes our Passover lamb. There is this great verse that's repeated three times in the New Testament. At the baptism, Jesus, the Father, says, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. See, this perfect love of the Father to the Son, that is not only to Jesus, it's to all of us who would become children of God. But this phrase, and this is repeated again on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus takes his inner circle of Peter, James, and John with him, and Moses and Elijah show up on the mountain, and the voice comes again, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. It impacted Peter so much that he repeats this again in 2 Peter chapter 1. This is my beloved son. I think if we were there on the mountain, it would greatly impact us. And Moses and Elijah are talking to Jesus. And in Luke 9.31, it says, They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. The word departure literally means exodus. Moses had a pretty significant exodus, right? Bringing the people 430 years out of Egypt. Elijah had a pretty significant exodus being brought to heaven in a chariot. They weren't talking to Jesus about their exodus moments. They were talking about what was to come on the cross. Because Jesus is the supreme exodus about his fulfillment. You see, when we find our story in the Bible and we identify with the exodus, it brings fulfillment in Jesus, the love of the God, a father to his son, perfect redemption. We can have that exodus. Through the plagues and the Passover, God demonstrates his sovereignty as the one true God we must worship and obey. Louis Zamperini was a war hero, a record setting mile runner. But while he was back home and freed from war captivity, he was never truly free till he surrendered his life to Jesus. As part of his continual battle with PTSD, in his nightmares, he would regularly encounter his tormentor called the bird, who would continually, night after night, torment him and say, you'll never be free of me. But when he was laying in that life raft, he prayed to God, if you save me, I'll give my life to you. God answered, but Louis didn't come through on his Part of the bargain till he fell to his knees and surrendered his life to Jesus at that revival. And you know what happened? He never was tormented in his nightmares again. Jesus set him free. Jesus became his supreme exodus. What's your exodus moment, church? How has God freed you? How has God brought you out? And how can you see Jesus as the fulfillment of all your hopes and dreams? How can God be sovereign in our lives? And how can we go out from any sins that entangle us and worship him as the one true 
God. We sang it in the song, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one like him in all the earth. There's nothing like the freedom, the peace, the joy, the exodus from sin that Jesus brings. Are there any idols you need to lay at the feet of Jesus today? Anything you need to forgive? Anything you need to confess, to be free? To make your exodus moment, to go out and to worship God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let my people go so that they may worship me with all their heart. I loved praying with someone this week. I loved sitting outside of the church and praying with them, and, and God just revealed it was unforgiveness, and we just confessed it, and we just said it's got to go, and you could see in the breath just this letting go and this taking in the love of God. It was an exodus moment. It was a freedom moment. And we can have those day after day. We can have them daily. You can come to the altar. You can pray with someone today and be set free. We don't have to walk in bondage anymore. Let my people go. Let my people go so that they may worship me with all their heart. Would you pray with me? Abba, Father, we just thank you for your love for the Son. God, we just thank you for these, these great words that are repeated three times in the New Testament. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And God, thank you. That's not just for your Son. That's Jesus dies on the cross and sheds the blood for our sins, and we can be entered into the family of God, and we are all your beloved sons and daughters. And thank you for your love, God. Thank you that you hear our prayers. Thank you that you want to set us free. Thank you that there is no one like you in all the earth. God, we worship you today. We lift up the name of Jesus. And God, we just ask that your freedom will go out today. God, we just thank you that you, your grace is free. We just have to surrender. Holy Spirit, have your way today. Set your people free. May we worship you. May we find ways to worship you more and more. And we'll give you all the thanks and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.